Well, God and plan, God's plan involves a long, a long process. Certainly long in, in terms of a, a human life, but short in, uh, in the terms of, of uh, eternity. <clears throat> of first creating man, mankind, and then giving him these indelible lessons that he will eventually appreciate and the opportunities to achieve and exercise full freedom. You know, when, when mankind has really, really hard lessons, and there are millions and millions having hard, hard lessons, and that's billions out throughout all time. Why? But eventually they'll appreciate them. Well, if you look back at Adam and Eve, they were creative, created perfect, but were they really free? Well, we're not going to debate that. But they were not, they didn't have the freedom that God would ultimately intend. <clears throat> In uh, 1 John 118, Brother Russell says, It is a self-evident truth that for every right principle, there is a corresponding wrong principle. As, for instance, truth and falsity, love and hatred, justice and injustice, and we distinguish these opposite principles as right and wrong and their effects when put in action. And really, if there's a principle and there's no, you know, a principle, there's no corresponding right or wrong principle, you can't say whether whatever you're talking about was right or, right or wrong, because there's no opposite. So this is, I really love this. Well, without the knowledge the experience of both good and evil, Adam and Eve could not make proper decisions. They just they, they demonstrated that. And I appreciate it. Brother Russell said, what if they what if God had had set this up a thousand times with a thousand different perfect individuals, the result would be the same every time. Well we, Eve had a desire for more knowledge, so Satan offered a way to satisfy that desire. This resulted in breaking God's law and the fall of mankind. In Genesis 3.22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. Well, that no good and evil, <clears throat> that can be misleading. Because Adam, Adam and Eve did not have a full understanding of the principles of good and evil at this point. But they gained an enhanced awareness. In Genesis 3, 7, And the eyes of both of them were opened. They're more aware. So enough that they realized their nakedness and their need of a covering to shield themselves from God. So, you know, the fig leaves and things like this. <clears throat> we know that God provided something else. Okay. Well, mankind was now set on a path to bondage as they learn the, the lessons of evil sin selfishness and all its rewards and consequences we'll talk about the wages of sin a little bit later Romans 128 tells us and Paul tells us in Romans 128 as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind doing those things which King James says are not convenient. I think they really euphemize, euph euphemize that. Things which were loathsome, not convenient. I mean, that's way too weak. Loathsome. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of his thoughts of his heart was only evil and that continually. They weren't thinking, oh, how can I do something good? They were thinking of the wrong thing to do again and again, and worse and worse. And Actually, you kind of see some of that today where people outdo the wickedness of, of their fellows. Go even farther, go even farther. Well, they were going downhill and they were picking up speed. Well, with flood, the flood, we know that God saved eight persons alive. Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Israel, and Egypt, you know, the, the descendants of Noah. And, of course, when we get to Egypt, here's Israel in bondage. Of course, this is a picture well, God had told Moses, and if you weren't here yesterday, here's part of what we talked about yesterday. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now this is interesting. What does this really mean? What does the firstborn get? The firstborn gets the firstborn's portion. 
the firstborn gets the absolute best inheritance the father could possibly give. So what is this greatest inheritance? <clears throat> well, we'll talk about that. This greatest inheritance the father has to give. And in Exodus 6, 5, And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Egypt, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Now, what covenant was that? Well, we talked about Genesis 17. But also in Genesis 13, God has said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now this is not 400 years in Egypt. A lot of folks make that mistake. But it's really from the time of, of Ishmael taunting and tormenting Isaac to when they're liberated from Egypt in 1615 BC. But in the, and he goes on, uh, God goes on and says, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. They're come, come back to the land. And then in Genesis 17, he talks about the covenant of circumcision we talked about yesterday, to bring them into the land and be their God. Well, God would prepare Israel for this greatest inheritance the Father could give, and what is that? It's really to be the bread of Christ. That's what he's preparing them for. So Moses is sent to Egypt to be God's representative in Israel's deliverance, and Moses tells them this great news, we talked about this yesterday, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I'll rid you of bondage. I'll redeem you with a stretched out arm. I will take you to, to me for a people, and I will be your God. I'll bring you into this land that I swear to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now, if you're in bondage, wouldn't this sound like a great, wonderful thing? You'd think they'd be jumping up and down. <clears throat> well, in response, Israel's hearing this. Now this is right after they had to make bricks without straw. Moses had told them good things and then brick making bricks without straw. So they're going saying, you know, oh, we'll believe it when we see it. In Exodus 6, 9, And Moses spoke so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. And I think that's really picturing the bondage of sin and death. <clears throat> the bondage of just trying to get through another day alive. They were so downcast and burdened, they didn't believe these wonderful prophet promises without solid proof. And this is one reason why God overruled that Pharaoh would have this tremendously hard heart. So it didn't take just one plague or two, and then Pharaoh rolled over and said, okay, you can go. It took ten plagues because God was going to prove to Israel again and again and again and again these miraculous overrulings. He was in control and he was going to deliver them. So they would then have proof even before crossing the Red Sea. They'd have proof. Well, with the last plague of Egypt, the death of the firstborn, Israel is now allowed to leave Egypt. Well, were they free now? Did they have liberty? Well, they were free from the physical enslavements, enslavement to the Egyptian taskmasters, but they were still in bondage to the effects of sin. Plus, they had been in an idolatrous nation subject to the influences of over 400 Egyptian gods. And I'm not sure if I can. We'll go here just for a second. <clears throat> And are you, oh, we're not You'd have to it. share that. Yeah, okay, the yeah, I got it. got it. Let me share this other thing here. I'll share that screen. But here are, are we getting it? Or not? Here it's, yep. Because here we are. This is in Wikipedia. Here are 400, <laughs> four, over 400 Egyptian gods. <laughs> so they're in a land with this kind of influence around them. Okay, well. We'll go back to the original share. Uh, okay, we'll just stop the share, reshare. But that was really impressive to me when you see uh, 400 Egyptian gods. Well, God brought them to Mount Sinai. Okay, where can we do that? Okay. 
got them, God brought them to Mount Sinai, and on the 50th day, and this is counting from the 16th of Abib, you know, Abib was the original month this month. The other months didn't have names. Nisan is really a Babylonian name. All the other months that they used after they were Babylonian. Because God numbered all the months relative to the Passover. That was the important thing. The Passover was the important thing. <clears throat> so, so, why did he bring them to Mount Sinai? He was going to give them the law. To give them the law. And in Galatians 3.19, Paul says, Wherefore, uh, should be blue. Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions. Well, that's kind of a negative statement. Till the seed should come to whom the promise would make. So it's until the seed should come. Well, this is not only Christ the head, but the body of Christ as well. As it was ordained by, or, uh, ordained by angels. He says, well, the law was given because they, Israel, really, they were like children. They were not competent to choose the correct path for themselves. They needed guidance, and they needed to know from whom that guidance was coming. Bring you into the land, I will be your God. Make sure you understand I'm your God. Well, the first commandment, Exodus 23, or 20, verses uh, 3 and 5, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. Now, they should have had compassion and love for God. They've been brought out. I mean, they've got they brought out of Egypt. There are all these miracles on the way. <clears throat> they should have understood that there was only one source of righteousness that would lead to freedom and the greatest inheritance that God could bestow. Well, in Exodus 19 to 24, they were given the moral law, really the law of property and you know the Decalogue, things like this. And in Exodus 24:7. <clears throat> and he took the book of the covenant and read in them in the audience of the people and they said all that the Lord hath said we will do so he's reading them he's probably reading not from the tablets or the tables so that came later probably parchment something or they're written on and here's the problem the laws were written on this on this parchment it wasn't written in their hearts yet that was God's goal I want to write it on their hearts so they hear it and they say, oh, all the things that God said, we will do, we'll do it. Well, notice this also included Exodus 20, 23. You will, you will not make gods of, to, uh, with me of, uh, you will not make gods with me, gods of, you will not make with me <laughs> gods of silver or gods of gold. There it is, right there. They just said, amen. We, we agree with that. Then Moses goes back up the mount to receive the ceremonial law. This is Exodus 25 to 31, the ceremonial law. Tabernacle, priesthood, how you build all these things. Well, then after 40 days, Israel says, huh, well, Moses is not coming down. What's going on? Uh, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron, hey, uh, make us some gods that will go before us because we, we don't know what's going on with Moses, uh, maybe he, he starved to death up there. We don't trust that God could preserve him. Well, after the miraculous deliverance for the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the quails, the manna, water from the rock, you name it. I mean, all these things, they didn't believe that God could preserve Moses for all this time. So Aaron, they said that Aaron says, well, break off your golden earrings. And uh, I've mentioned this in other times. Golden earrings. Picture in the hearing ear. If you're going to set up an idol other than other than the one true God, you don't need your hearing ear. Just break it off. Just break it off. Make your idol out of that. So that's the only gold that's mentioned. So Aaron makes this golden calf, and this was really the god Apis. And here's a picture of Apis. <clears throat> the the uh, golden calf, and we have the sun, you know, the sun up above, just like Apis. You know, it's one of those seven hundred or uh, four hundred gods. Well, it, Israel was fearful, and they had little faith in the God who had delivered them so decisively. Well, Moses comes down, who was on the Lord's side. Three thousand are killed in the aftermath of this grievous sin of unfaithfulness and breaking their covenant they had just made only 40 days earlier. 
And I don't think Israel had any idea how serious God was. He says, I'm preparing you for something through this wonderful heritage of several generations and lots of experiences. When my son is on the scene, you'll have a chance to be the bride of Christ. That's what I'm preparing you for. He says, and we're not going to mess around with any of this other stuff. I am serious. And they got to learn that. Well, with the institution of the Levitical sacrifices and ceremonies, Israel had typical justification through the Atonement Day sacrifices. Reprint 2425, uh, Brother Russell talks about this. He says, this arrangement merely shielded God's typical people, typically covered them, typically covered them through their law covenant. I thought that was interesting, a typical covering, not the, not the full covering that the body of Christ would have. So Israel could maintain this mediated covenant or relationship with God. But the ultimate standard for life was given in Leviticus 18.5. This is the amplified version. It says, so you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a person keeps them, he will live. I am the Lord. But this was an impossibility. All Israel continued to die, even with God's law. That freedom from death and sin at this point was still impossible. <clears throat> After all, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, and that had not been removed. But God blessed Israel in proportion to their regard for his laws regard for him and regard for his laws. In, in Leviticus 26, we want to look at this carefully. He says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, I'll give you rain in due season. The land shall yield her increase. I will give, give you peace in the land and other wonderful things there. Very similar to the promise in Exodus 6 is uh, repeated <clears throat> Leviticus 26, 12, and I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. He says this many, many times throughout the script, several times in Ezekiel as well. But, notice this, but, but if you will not hearken, means listen to me, and will not do all these commandments. And then he says, here's the, if it's, if this is the reason, the next verse, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgment, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant. So this is the condition. Now notice, it does not say, but if you try with all your heart to obey and you still can't do them. That's not what it says. It says if you abhor, if you abhor, uh, my judgments. You despise my statutes. You don't want this relationship with God. If you don't want this relationship with me, and you show that by despising these wonderful laws that are meant to elevate you. Leviticus 26, 16, I'll bring you sudden terror, diseases, you'll destroy your sight, I'll sap your, your strength will be sapped. Sow your seed in vain, your enemies will eat, will eat it. I will set my face against you. You'll be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you. And I think the worst, you'll flee when none pursue you. In other words, I want you to live in fear. I want you to live in fear. This is a chastisement. Come back to the covenant you made and receive the blessings that I want to give you. Well, God wanted Israel to appreciate that his law embodies the righteous principles of love and help, helpfulness to one another. He wanted that in their hearts. He wanted this to grow. Well, before Moses' death, he repeated the law, now but with more feeling to the children of those who had learned from the failures of their parents. We talked about that yesterday. Deuteronomy 6, 5. And thou shalt... Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. After all, if they loved the Lord and his commandments, then they would have no other gods. 
It's all based on the love of God. The law showed the standard of perfection and morally elevated Israel above the surrounding idolatrous nations whose gods preyed on the fallen carnal desires of the people. Now, <clears throat> if you ever go to a carnival or a fair, you find that kind of thing. Oh, this show's just for adults. Why? Well, because they're preying on the carnal desires of, of this person. And, you know, whatever it is. Websites, same thing. <clears throat> well, God was, was gradually preparing Israel through their heritage of several generations to be ready to become the bride of Christ. He came on his own, they all, they all received him not, but as many as received him gave he the power to become the sons of God. That's why the law was given, to guide them, to be a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. Well, Israel crossed Jordan. Some, some tribes fought the Canaanites and to take the land, but others like Dan, not that Dan in the back of the room there, but <laughs> others like Dan refused their allotted portion and they took other land. They went up north, took Laish, and killed and slaughtered some essentially defenseless people, defenseless, peaceful people. But they were to slay the Canaanites and take no prisoners so that there would be no pagan influences to corrupt them. God wanted no bad influences to corrupt Israel and stumble them from the path that God had set out for them. Well, when many chastisements, captivities, famines, etc. happened to Israel due to their unfaithfulness, all they had to do was look at Leviticus 26. Why is this happening? Well, if you walk in my... Verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments, good things will happen and God will walk among you to bless you. And if you despise my statutes, in verse 15, bad things will happen. Really, really bad. It's like, are you getting it? Are you getting it? Well, many of them just didn't ever get it. But this was not a maybe thing. This was as sure as gravity. This was a law God gave them. Well, David was a man after his own heart. Now, he was not perfect. He failed with Bathsheba. You know, he, he had these fleshly desires. But again, Leviticus didn't, didn't say, if you try with all your heart, and you still can't do it. He was trying with all his heart, but he still couldn't do it. God loved him. He was beloved of God. He did not despise God or God's statutes. He loved them. He knew he was weak. And God says, even though you're weak, and you sin. I love you, David. I'm going to give you the corrections you need. So you'll see me and you'll see the justice in that. He wrote in Psalm 119, verse 10, 16, and 165, With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. He loved the Lord and he knew he was weak. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy law. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them, or nothing will stumble them. Well, Solomon started out pretty well. But later in life, he had 700 wives, most of whom were idolatrous. He chose this path to idolatry. And we know that 10, during uh, his son's reign, 10 of the tribes, Follow Jeroboam in the worship of two golden calves. Oh, we're back to the golden calves again. These ten tribes were taken captive by the Assyrians, again according to the punishments foretold in Leviticus 26. There it is. God had God also hated even those who were didn't follow with these ten tribes. He hated perfunctory worship. Well, let's just go through the motions. Let's just go through the motions, ceremonies. Priests and the people merely going through motions of the letter of the law. In Isaiah 1, 11 and 15, I'm full of burnt offerings of rams, fat of beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks and lambs. When you spread forth your hands, <clears throat> I will hide my eyes. When you make prayers, I will not hear them because your hands are full of blood. And he's not talking about blood of sacrifice. He's talking about blood of all the other people, even their own people they were taking advantage of. 
He wanted true, heartfelt worship because the people saw a better path, a higher path that, pointed out, that was pointed by the spirit of the law. Isaiah 117, learn to do well. Seek judgment. In other words, you do it. Learn it and do it. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Be their advocate to make sure that things are done right for the ones who are weak and helpless. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And I think what God was really trying to tell them is at this point that if they would give him their hearts, he would arrange for their at one with him, the full at one with him that many were looking for. Most, no, didn't care. But many said, we want to know this God. Well, if they saw the beauty in God's laws and they showed that they were giving their hearts to God and were placing their lives in God's hands and God's wisdom, <coughs> then they would, see the, they would see that the law showed fairness, equity, love, justice, and mercy. And with the continued idolatry and rejection of laws of God and his laws, all the Jews later were taken off their land. In again, in accordance with Leviticus, 26. Mm -hmm. During Zedekiah, and if we walk, con and if you walk contrary to me and will not hearken unto me, you know, this is after other chastisements, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I mean, God says, You do this, you do good, good will happen, you do bad, bad will happen, you do really bad, really bad things will happen. But God's mercy was prophetically shown in the dedication of the temple during the reign of Solomon. In 1 Kings 8, 46, this is in uh, the dedication. <coughs> Solomon saying, If they sin against thee, and thou deliver them into the hand of into their enemies, and they carry them away captives, that's what happened in Babylon, unto the land of the enemy. If they shall bethink themselves, in other words, if, they're gonna, if they finally come to their senses and pay attention to what God had told them, and return unto thee with, their, with all their heart and pray unto thee toward their land and the city which thou hast chosen and the house which I have built for my name, that's the temple. In 1 Kings 8, 49 and 5th, then hear and forgive. And brethren, this is why Daniel prayed openly to God uh, toward Jerusalem from Babylon. He was not making this up. Well, let's see, maybe this will work. No, he was, this was the dedication of the temple. He was instructed to do this. Mm -hmm. He was preserved in the den of lions. Israel was delivered in the reign of, of Cyrus. Where are we? Well, once Israel was delivered back to the land, the synagogue was system, system was set up because uh, even though they had these priests and the priests should read the law once every seven years, they realized these priests have failed us. Look at what has happened. They're ineffective. Even though you had these 48 Levitical cities all over, it's not working. It's not working out. They were supposed to read the law, and this is really good, 31.12. Gather the people together, the men, the women, the strangers, that they may hear and learn to fear and reverence the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of their law of this law. But that was way back in the instruction that Moses gave them. But this really did not happen. It was ineffective. With a, well, by the time of Jesus' ministry, the Sanhedrin had reduced the worship of God to a set of ceremonies and traditions. But there were still many who wanted to serve God with their whole heart. These Israelites indeed. Israel was a vassal state in subjection to the Roman Empire. They longed to be free, and they looked for their promised Messiah to effect this deliverance from Rome. But they had no idea of the type of freedom and deliverance that they really needed. People had become accustomed to their own failings, their own shortcomings, especially when they saw no way out. Well, that's just the way we are. You know, I just can't help it. 
And, you know, there are many people in bondage, I mean, at this day, I mean, all, for, all throughout history, and re they rely on the security and familiarity of that bondage. They get used to it. They depend on it. In fact, some felons, guys in prison, they've been in prison for decades, they have more fear of the being released from prison than of the bars that they've learned to depend on. Those bars become a source of security. And very few could even comprehend what full, complete freedom really is from all the things that are weighing them down. But God says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your, my, your ways my ways, saith the Lord for this. The heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, Jesus knew that the shepherds of Israel, the scribes, Pharisees, Sanhedrin, chief priests, they were false shepherds. They were leading their followers into more bondage and tasks that were impossible to do. They reveled in the praise of man and their own, and their own pride and the material wealth that they gained. Matthew 23, 4, this is very near the end of Jesus' ministry. He said, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, they lay on them men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Well, many people wanted to know the path to the true worship of God and to know the true character of God, which had been hidden by their leaders. God had been actually hidden by the priests and the scribes and Pharisees. Well, Jesus told them, Come unto me, all you that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, when Jesus humbly explained God's compassion and mercy to the people, they were captivated by his honest message. And I really... Love this on, uh, Brother Russell says on third volume, page 188, he says that the temple or sanctuary class at the first advent was represented by the Lord's disciples. They weren't following the scribes and priests anywhere. They realized they don't have anything. You know, to whom should we go? Thou only had the words of life. They realized that. They had left the influences of the scribes and Pharisees. They were being cleansed by Jesus' message, and by their faith in him as God's representative, the Messiah of God, the Son of the living God. Jesus had said on his last night, ye are, John 13, 10, ye are clean, but not all. They were looking for a shepherd to lead them toward God and to the freedoms that God wanted them to have, but they didn't know what this would entail and how complete this freedom would be. Jesus was unlike the scribes and Pharisees. He didn't simply give rules and traditions to keep and to look down on them if they weren't meticulous and, and like the privileged Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees, they were the holiness people and everybody else was uh, sinners and publicans and sinners. I, I mean, I just realized that not too long ago. There were just two classes in their minds Pharisees and publicans and sinners. That's it. If you're not us, you're you're dirt. You know. Well, Jesus was Jesus preaching reached into the hearts of those who wanted to know the true God. He didn't say blessed are those who tithe precisely every year. He said blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He showed the spirit of the law. <clears throat> he says you've heard. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But he says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Well, because they're under a burden of sin. They're burdened with sin. But as you're coming out of it, you can help them. Be kind to them. Be ye therefore perfect or complete, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And that was all Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Well, God was, uh, God's law, keep in mind, was not a smorgasbord 
to pick and do only those things which you like. You know, we tithe mint and anise, but you get reject the, the weightier uh, features of the law. The law was a unit, but it had many explanatory components. You know, well, here's, here's this detail, that detail. But it was summed up by Jesus, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy soul and all thy mind, quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, quoting Deuteronomy 19.18. And Jesus was saying, if you do these two, if you got these two, and you're actually living these, you're doing the whole law. Everything else is a detail. It showed, he showed them a different way. He said, don't lay out treasures on earth. You know, lots of parables about that. He was looking at the scribes and Pharisees, he was looking at what they were do, doing, you know, the farmer who tear down his barns and <clears throat> make bigger. He said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The golden rule, all things whatsoever you would, uh, that men should do to you, you do it to them. For he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes. This wasn't just a bunch of rules. This was principles to live by. Well, Jesus, when he healed the leper, which I, think, which I really appreciate, he says, Jesus said to him, See thou tell no man, but go show thyself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony. Well, why, if you're going to tell no man, why show that to a priest? Why? Why that? Well, the priests had the responsibility to judge leprosy. This is in the laws in Leviticus. They would have known this leper. They would know that he has this incurable disease that rotting his body while he was alive. It was eating him alive. And they would have irrefutable proof of the miraculous cure effected by Jesus. They're the judges of leprosy. <clears throat> well, Jesus also knew that these leaders of Israel were neglecting their duties. <coughs> when, Jesus, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. They were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Now why do sheep need a shepherd? Because they're defenseless. They're going to eat. They're going to follow their leader. But wolves, any, any predator can just take them and kill them. They're subject to anything. Weather, storms, predators. They had no shepherd. And I really appreciate it. He was moved with compassion. Well, Jesus was seeking the lost sheep of the house of Israel, those who wanted to know God, but who were rejected by the scribes and the Pharisees as sinners, as publicans and sinners. I mean, he's looking out and seeing this terrible situation. Well, Jesus later spoke of the full freedom, full freedom being offered to the Israelites indeed. At the Feast of Tabernacles, it was either on the last day or perhaps one extra day, because the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, after, it was about a week after the Day of Atonement, you know, so it was one of the three feasts when all the males or Israel were supposed to be there, and the, the uh, Israel would swell from about 100,000 to perhaps over 2 million people. And here he is on the porch of the temple saying, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's really the crux of what we're talking about. We finally got there. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, many replied to him out of the ignorance of their own condition. We are Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou? ye shall be made free. Well, Jesus gets right to the point. This is a New American Standard. He says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave, then he goes on, he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. Now, brother also really doesn't 
comment much on this, but I think Paul in Romans 6.23 is explaining this. Why would the slave not be able to be in the house forever? Now the next verse, this is a paraphrase, he's saying, Abraham would never do such a thing. He says, you're, you say you're the children of Abraham? Well, how come you wouldn't act like Abraham then? Abraham wouldn't kill somebody for bringing them the truth. Remember the three angels that came to him? Told them this wonderful news. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Your son, you're going to have a son next year? Abraham wouldn't say, well, get out of here. No, he would, he would, he did his, uh, the best he could for them. But Jesus goes on and says, you're doing the deeds of your father. You say you're the son, of, you're the children of Abraham, and you want to kill me? You're telling me who your father really is. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Jesus was showing them their bondage to sin, selfishness, pride, murder, and Satan. But for Jesus' followers, the path to freedom wasn't just right there at the Feast of Tabernacles. It required that Jesus free those who were in the sheepfold of the Law Covenant. They were still under the Law Covenant. That by that Law Covenant had penned them in and protected Israel, and it elevated them above their pagan neighbors. It was this schoolmaster to bring them to Christ, but it was, it was penning them in. The requirements of the law prevented them from fully approaching God as sons. Well, Jesus presented himself as the porter, <clears throat> that, at, to the porter. The porter was really God's justice, and he gave his life for the sheep. He allowed them to, for his followers to come out of this pen of the law covenant because he was fulfilling the law covenant even unto death. Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. Plus, in Galatians 3.13, Paul tells us Christ hath redeemed us, this is Israel, from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. He put an end to the law. <clears throat> Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. To those who came to appreciate Jesus, his teachings, and his sacrifice, he was the door to the sheep. He was the door to leave the constrictions. I mean, the blessings, yes, but also the constrictions and restrictions of the law covenant where they could not be seen as God's sons. They couldn't fully know God and his love. <clears throat> Jesus was the door to the sheep. In John 10, 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go out in and out and find pasture. What God truly wanted them to have. And this gives deep meaning to Psalm 23 for the true sheep. Well, the Jews who rejected Jesus were still in bondage to the requirements of the law. Now, they were still blessed by the law if they would do it. But they were in bondage to the requirements of the law. Well, after Pentecost, the message of, of uh, Jesus' work was spread to thousands. But this is still only a small proportion of Israel. Now again, Pentecost was one of these three great feasts where Israel went from about 100,000 and swelled to 2 million on the day of Pentecost, which is an amazing, talk about an event planner. God had orchestrated this 
for well over 1,600 years in the law that all the, all the most faithful, I mean, it was an expensive trip, the most faithful would come, and that's who God wanted. It's like the Marines. We only want the very best. We only want a few good men. We want the absolute cream of the cream of the crop to be there to hear Peter on this day. And if you're willing to go through all of this expense and travel to be there, God says, you're the ones I want to hear. I want you to hear this. And Peter tells them the things that they need to hear on the day of Pentecost. But still, only, I think it was about 3,000 came in that day. Out of 2 million? I mean, that's a teeny, teeny proportion. Well, this path of freedom was gradually becoming clearer, but it wasn't once saved, always saved. There was work involved. What Jesus said is still true for all of his followers. Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. We should uh, remind ourselves of that every day. We allow the flesh, you know, to, to lead us astray. That we're we're entering slavery again. We don't want that to happen. Well, we have lots of work to do on our path to freedom. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove, not just know, but prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, we have this higher law of love and faith in the one who did the law. We can't do it, but we have faith in the one who did. Even unto death, and was raised again for our justification. But we are still imperfect, and we are still in sin. What then? What then? Well, Paul addresses this, <clears throat> and I have quite a few verses here. He says, Paul says, well, what I'm doing, he's looking at his attitude, you know, what his real heart's desire are. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do. I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I don't want to do, I agree with the law. I'm confessing that the law is good. I'm confessing the law is good. So now it's no longer I am the one doing it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, the new creature. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with a mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. And brethren, this is just like Leviticus 26. If you're trying with all your hearts, if you sin because you abhor God and you hate his, his statutes, well, bad things. No, no. That's not for the body of Christ. But if you're trying for with all your heart, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. That's what God always wants. It's the mind, the will that is the new creature. This is who God is dealing with. Our flesh is sacrificed and dead. That's how God sees it. We have to keep it dead to the best of our ability. Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Well, I thought we couldn't do the law. Oh, let's read the rest. Who walk not after flesh, but after the Spirit. That's an amazing thing. The righteousness of the law could be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, according to what God has provided for us. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. And I like Brother Don, he said one time, that he said, some, he did something, he wasn't happy with it, and he sort of says, all right, flesh, all right. <laughs> Get in subjection. Get into subjection. We have to cease from our own works, you know, the works of the flesh. And this is Romans 4.11, Romans, or excuse me, Hebrews 3.11, and 3 and 4 is really hearkening back to the provocation of the spies, you know, and they're, when they provoke God. He says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Now, does that sound contradictory? You have to labor to enter into rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief, the example of those who failed at Kadesh Barnea. For he that is entered into his rest, now we're not talking about a funeral service. Oh, yeah, Uncle George has entered into his rest. All right, well, there he is in that grave. Well, the old man should be in that grave and stay there. 
but it doesn't mean ultimate death. He has entered into his rest. He also has ceased from his works as God did from his. Well, when God rested, he didn't die. He didn't die. So we have to cease from the works, the worldly works, but do the works of God. <clears throat> well, doing these things throughout our consecration, we continue in this warfare. We talked about this yesterday. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Because the weapons of our warfare, they're mighty through the casting down of strongholds, bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. And as we said yesterday, those are our thoughts. We can't change the thoughts of others. You know, I talked to this wonderful man on the elevator. Elevator talk, is, you got about 30 seconds. <laughs> But I'm the one I have to get. I'm the one who have to take care of my thoughts. Well, in doing these things, we have freedom from the effects of sin. We can keep the future in memory. What a wonderful thing we have that the world has. They don't have this at all. We can keep the future in memory and always rely on the blood of Christ to cleanse our robes. 1 John 1, 9 and 1 John 2, 1, if we confess our sins, in other words, we acknowledge and we don't say, oh, yeah, the robe of Christ righteous, it just covers it, we don't have to worry about it. Well, that way, nothing's really happening. We have to confess our sins <coughs> and uh, know that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well, this warfare continues in us, this side of the veil, just as David was told. 2 Samuel 2.10, The sword shall never depart from thine house. This was a wonderful blessing. He realized I have to keep fighting the battles. I have to keep fighting the battles. A picture of us, this side of the veil, the veil. We have to keep fighting. When our warfare is finished, we will be granted this full deliverance, this full freedom, the other side of the veil. And this is apolutrosis, which means a loosing away, or a loosing away from the flesh. To do what? Well, not to play with the dog and go fishing, but to help bless all the families of the earth to show them their path to freedom, which, brethren, they do not see. They don't even know there is a path. John 10, verses, John 10, 16. Jesus said, And other sheep have I, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, that they sh and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Isaiah 26, 9. And when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants will learn righteousness. There's a learning process. The highway of holiness, we're all familiar with this, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy for and joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. <clears throat> Romans 8, 21, because it says, it says really the, because the creature, but it really means the world of mankind. Because the world of mankind itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. There's their bondage into the glorious liberty of the children of God. They don't even know the bondage they're in. But they'll be made aware. The ancient worthies are going to be helping them. With it. And when all mankind are fully reconciled to God, then what, John, what Jesus said in John 8.32, they shall know the truth, and the truth shall make them free. And one of my favorite scriptures, I have to put this in. Numbers 4.21, this is after the failure of Kadesh Barnea. It's like God says, I'm not discouraged. He says, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord.